scream, you scream, we all scream for glycine. It's the smallest amino acid that'll ever be seen. So glycine is the first amino acid that I am going to talk about in my 20 days of amino acids. So amino acids are protein letters among other things and they all have the same general backbone structure where they have this carboxyl group and this amino group and they can use this to link together in peptide bonds. But in addition to those generic parts that allow them to link together, they have unique side chains or R groups that stick off. And so these are really what distinguished them and when you link them together, it's the unique parts that like stick out and help influence how the protein folds and stuff and because of their different properties. So I'm gonna take you one by one through the amino acids and their like what makes them special. And so dun dun dun, dun glycine, it has a hydrogen. Seriously, that was it? Yeah, so glycine is the smallest amino acid. It's the like simplest, I guess, um, in some senses because it just has a hydrogen. But when you think of G for glycine, think loosey goosey because glycine is far from generic. It is a weirdo on my chart of amino acids because it just has this hydrogen. It's a lot more flexible than something that has like a big bulky group and can't rotate very much. So it can like move all around. Um, and so it's often found in like kinky regions of a protein, like where you have like a turn or something like that, um, or in more like disordered regions because um, it allows for great flexibility. I think like, oh, for like mutagenesis or whatever, if you wanna see what a certain amino acid does, oh, maybe just mutate it to glycine. No, we're gonna see you're gonna mutate it to alanine usually because glycine, it's so, flexi it's so flexible that it can um, make regions of a protein more flexible. Um, and so that's not really generic at all. Um, and so we're gonna get more into glycine in terms of its properties, its discovery, um, and all sorts of things about it. We have a bunch of it in the lab um, because it's also really useful as like a buffer so like a tris glycine gel we use glycine as a buffer because it has this like all amino acids it has this like carboxyl group and the amino group and these can act as like an acid and a base um and help stabilize the ph um so they're called amphoteric or amphoprotic as we've talked about and we'll get into more um and because it just has this hydrogen here and this isn't coming off or anything so that's not going to influence the ph so but you can use this as a buffer um so it's kind of um cool right um so buffer is like a ph stabilizer um and so looks wise it looks kind of it's like a white granular thing kind of looks like sugar um and in fact that's kind of how it got it was discovered and got its name as we'll t talk about um so this guy was trying to get sure see if you could they found people were like oh we could get sugar from like cellulose and from all this other stuff i wonder if we add some acid to gelatin if we could get sugar from that too and so he did and he got this thing and he's like, ooh, let's taste this. Don't taste things in the lab. But anyway, he did, it tasted sweet and we get the name sugar. Uh, we get the name glycine um, eventually. Um, there were some name changes because some other guy didn't think that the name that was originally given to it was like cool enough. It was this guy named Henry Brackenot and this was in 1820. Um, and he, cause he thought it was sugar. So he named it sucre de gelatin, uh, so like, sugar from gelatin and that was translated into G german as lime zucker uh, other scientists later so like this guy named even norton Hors horsford he didn't like that original name because he's like dude this is not a sugar i know it's not a sugar i found now that it's not a sugar and so he suggested this name glycolol which means sweet glue um but then a couple years later another scientist berzelius he's like no that name doesn't jive with the other amino acids that we know um and so then he suggested the shorter name glycine and that's what finally stuck um yeah so dun, 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 our first in the 20 days of amino acid advent is glycine um and so glycine's three letter code its nickname i like to call it is gly and its initial is g um so there's other protein amino acids that start with G, but glycine got there first, um, so it gets G. So if you see G, think glycine, think loosey goosey. And you can also think codons that start with GG um, because basically glycine has that corner of the codon table covered. Um, and so basically, if you're unfamiliar with codons, um, you can, they're basically how the letters are spelled when 
the um, ribosomes, so the protein making instructions are reading out the what letter, what order to put the amino acids in. That's decided by the codon. Um, and so we'll be going through like the different codons that um, spell for different amino acids. Um, so that, and then this tRNA note helps bring the one to be added. Um, and more on that in like the translation posts. Um, but so glycine is, has GGA, GGU, GGG, and GGC. So if any of those show up um, when the ribosomes move it along, then the tRNA with the glycine will come and bring it. Um, yeah, so it is the run to the pack. It's the smallest amino acid, um, but that by no way is, makes it boring um, because it's really flexible, so it can take on weird angles. So as we mentioned, it's the smallest amino acid um, because it has just that single hydrogen as its side chain. And this has important consequences when it comes to how the protein takes its shape. So amino acids are the individual letters, and then they link up and form these chains. Um, and they're kind of like these chains of planes because this, as we talked about in yesterday's post, this um, peptide bond. So this bond is resonance stabilized. So basically there's like electron sharing between them all. And this makes it, you know, this makes it strong and restricts its motion because these, this both has like partial bonded character. So the way you typically draw it with like the oxygen being double bonded you actually have this resonance where this electrons are really being shared between all three. And this can only happen if they stay in a plane. And so you will only get rotation um, at like specific points and you don't get rotation within this peptide bond just around it. Um, so you can have phi rotation, which is between the nitrogen and the carbon and then psi rotation, which is the carbon and the carbon. Um, and so you end up with this restricted motion. Um, and the motion is going to be, um, you can have motion around these single bonds because you can't have motion rotation around a double bond. It's basically a thing. And because you have double bonded character throughout this, you can't rotate around it. But you can rotate around single bonds. So you can rotate around these. However, the limit, you're going to have your motion limited because you don't, it's like something's clashing into you when you're trying to rotate. And therefore, there are different specific angles that like amino acids tend to take when they link up into those chains. And we can actually plot these angles on one of these Ramachandran plots that are showing these backbone dihedral angles. So dihedral because they're between two planes. Um, and so you'll note that like, there in, this is this is generic. And so there are different forms, like different secondary structures, like secondary structures or like the structure a protein gets based on it, like, hydrogen bonding with its generic backbone. Um, and so common ones are like beta strands and alpha helices. And these require, these are optimal structures for the protein to like optimize all its like hydrogen bonding. Um, and they involve these specific like backbone angles, like these characteristic angles. Um, and so if you were to plot like the average, like where would you find, what angles would you find things in most of the time? And one of these plots with like psi over phi, um, you see that the darker the region is, the more often you'll find um, amino acid there. Um, and so this is for like the generic ones. This is a general. And then if you look at glycine, you can see that its pattern is super different because glycine is super flexible. It's like spread out a lot more over places and it can be in weird weird orientations and stuff because it's so flexible. One of the places that you'll find it, so you often find it in like the kinks or turns leading into those more structured structural elements, like those more like characteristic like helices and motifs and stuff that glycine is like super duper flexible. And so it can like break those up. Um, you might think it would fit nicely, but um, it, because it's so flexible, it can kind of destabilize structures. And so you often find it more in like disordered regions and like linker regions and stuff. But you do find it in this like collagen triple helix. So normally we have like, you don't think about proteins being in a helix like this, um, but collagen makes this cool triple helix and it's kind of an awkward angle and it has this like proline, which is really awkward guy. Um, but in you have a lot of glycines helping out to kind of make it possible um, for this structure to form. So we'll talk about that more as we go into, um, as we talk about proline. Glycine is, is what we call a um, non-essential amino acid. So that doesn't mean that we don't need it. Our bodies do need it, but we 
our bodies can also make it. Um, and so it actually, um, glycine here is actually gets made from serine. Um, and so we'll look at serine later, but basically there's this enzyme serine hydroxymethyl transferase um, and it can, basically serine has like CH3OH group has its side chain and this enzyme, so this reaction helper can remove that to give you glycine. Um, and it, with the help of this cofactor THF. Um, then you can also, so that would be the like um, production of glycine. You can also break glycine down and the typical way that it's broken down is with, through this like glycine cleavage complex. Um, and so it breaks it down into carbon dioxide and ammonia. Um, you can also like make things from glycine parts. Um, so glycine is one of like its parts can be used to make um, purines, which are the unique parts of um, the DNA and RNA letters A and G. So the, the double ringy ones. And so part of that ring could be made from glycine. Um, it can also be used in like this tripeptide glutathione, which is used as an antioxidant. Um, so it can help um, counter oxidative stress and make like reverse cysteine cysteine cross links. Um, it can also is part can be used to make porphyrins, um, which are like things like your heme, so like in hemoglobin, helping carry oxygen, and all sorts of cool stuff. It is what we call glucogenic, which means that it can be used for making glucose or blood sugar. Um, so you can see that glycine can be converted to pyruvate, um, and then that could enter this. Um, carboxylic acid cycle, which is sometimes called Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle, um, which can be used um, to make glucose. In the lab, we sometimes use glycine as a pH buffer. Um, so pH is the measure of proton availability. Um, kind of confusingly, it's a negative, it's an inverse log. Um, and so the more protons there are, the um, more, the lower the pH and the more acidic and the fewer proteins there are, the higher the pH, and the fewer protons there are, the higher the pH, and the more basic. Um, and the pH buffer is something that can act as both an acid, something that donates a proton, and the base, something that takes a proton. And it can do this giving and taking in order to keep the pH constant. Um, and so we often use glycine as a buffer because like all amino acids, it's what we call um, it's amphoteric, um, so it can act as both an acid and a base. So it has that carboxylic group that can act as a base and accept the proton, and the protonated amine group can act as an acid and give a proton. Note that this is different than how you might be normally like learn or think about things with this being a carboxylic acid, but the truth is that in its the state that we find it in our body is like this Witter ion state. Um, so if you go to a higher pH, um, so in this Witter ion state, this group is already acted. The carboxylic acid has already acted as an acid. It's already given up proton. So now it is its conjugate base. And so it can act as a base. And this amine group has already acted as a base and taken a proton. And now it can act as an acid and give a proton. And so often you see when you learn about, it's kind of confusing. It's kind of like general convention is to draw things in their like non-ionic form. Um, so you often see it drawn in like this where you have this NH2 and this OH and some of my figures are like that too because that's basically like the convention we use. But really what you have is this Witter ion form. And so this Witter ion is like where you have positive and negative parts that cancel out to give you a neutral mo molecule overall. And so what happens is if you go to a higher pH, so a higher pH, fewer protons available, um, more basic, then this um, protonated amine group is going to lose its proton. Um, and, but at the, the carboxyl group will already have lost this proton. So basically this carboxylic acid group can lose, it loses its proton at like a really low pH, just a strong, um, strong enough acid that once you're, uh, unless you're at like a pH of like two, it's going to be deprotonated. The amine group 
it's only going to be deprotonated if you get to a really high pH. So the, this amine group likes to hold on to the proton and this oxygen doesn't. Because when it gives up that proton, now this is resonance stabilized and we'll be happy. Um, and so this is almost always going to be deprotonated. And if you go, you have to go to a higher, a lower pH in order to get it protonated. But when you go down to that low pH, then this is this amine group has been protonated long before that. Because remember the amine group, you will have to get it um, to like a super high pH in order to deprotonate it. So basically, if you go to a low pH, this is going to be charged and this will be neutral. So you have a positively charged. If you go to a high pH, this will be neutral and this will be negatively charged. So you'll have a negative charge. So you're never really going to be in that state where you have this non-ionic form. However, that's typically how it's drawn by convention. And so sorry that I sometimes use that too, um, but that's, that's the reality. But it also makes the terminology kind of confusing if you're learning that it, carboxylic acid is acting, can act as an acid because when, we, when it's like actually in its natural form, it's already acted as an acid. And so it's negatively charged and can now act as this conjugate base. Much more on that in my post on Zwitter ions. Um, but basically, yeah, so that's why um, the ends are usually charged um, and then they cancel out and you have a neutral molecule overall. And so, um, be, but because those groups can act as an acid or a base, it can help um, stabilize the pH. And that's why we can use glycine as a buffer. Um, and so, yeah, so glycine is good because it just has, I mean, it's little and stuff and it doesn't have like side chains that can get protonated or do all sorts of weird stuff and interact with stuff. But the one thing to be cautious about if you are using glycine as a linker, um, sorry, if you are using glycine as a buffer is that it has, because it's an amino acid, it has an amine group. Um, if you're trying to do like cross-linking, the cross-linker will react with that amine group in your buffer. And so don't use a glycine-based buffer when you're doing cross-linking. Uh, more on that in the cross-linking post. And also don't use stress. And it's a chiral. Um, and so chirality, we'll see that the other ones are all going to be chiral. So um, basically this alpha carbon, if you have a carbon that's attached to four different things, so it, it's, we call it like a chiral center. And so basically you could have, if you have two groups coming off of the car, four groups coming off of the carbon, they could be sticking off in different ways. And so with their amino acids, so remember we like our backbone part is like constant, but we have these, this carbon, it's bound to a hydrogen and it's also bound to um, the side chain. So by in glycine, you have it bound to two hydrogen. So now, Carbon's only bonded to three things, so it's not chiral. It's not a chiral center anymore. Um, and because basically you could think of if, so chirality and stereochemistry, it has, stereochemistry has to do with like the 3D orientation in space. So you could think of if this was not, uh, if this was not another hydrogen, like if it were some weird thing sticking off. This isn't really, this is just to show you. So it could be sticking off the front or this could be switched and I could have the hydrogen in the front and this in the back. But note that I would have to like take this off and put move it. So these are like non interconvertible. I mean, like these are different stereo isomers, these different forms. They're like these non superimposable mirror images. And so all the amino acids we deal with are going to be L. Um, that our bodies use. Um, there's some bacteria that use like D in their walls and stuff, uh, but we use all amino acids. Um, but for glycine, it doesn't matter because I could stick this hydrogen on the front or the, on the back or this one on the front or on the back and it wouldn't matter because they're the same. Like it's, they're both hydrogen. Um, we can't like tell them apart. Um, so yeah, so that's why it is called a chiral. And we'll talk more about chirality later. But we don't have to worry about it for glycine because that carbon is only attached to three different things um, because it has two copies of the hydrogen. So it's not a chiral center. This in the blog form, um, but there's some pretty cool early protein chemistry, but basically um, glycine was the first amino acid to be isolated by acid hydrolysis um, from a protein. Um, by Henry Brackenkot in 1820. Yeah, so asparagine was like the first amino acid to be discovered, but they didn't even know they were, it was a protein part um, until years later. Um, and so, yeah, so glycine gets the first um, and 